Thanks, Walter, for those kind of words. Um, Aaron, um, just a little bit more on, on Aaron. He's one of one of he's one of the top undergraduate students that I've had the pleasure of teaching and advising since I've been here at Wayne State. And uh, he did so well in my the sociology 4996 course, which is a capstone course for sociology, um, that we continued our conversations after class. After the class ended, we continued our conversations about research, and um, we realized that we had very similar research interests, and so I invited Aaron to work on a paper with, um, with my dad and I, and he did a great job of working with the paper in terms of helping out with the literature review, as well as um, helping out with analysis and interpreting the analysis. Um, so Aaron contributed um, a great deal to the paper that's currently in the review, that politics and religion, and as well as um, the presentation. Um, and also, just in addition, Aaron and I are working on another project um, in the near future with the, another colleague at Oakland University looking at religion and racial attitudes. Um, so it's been great uh, working with Aaron. Even when he, when he goes on to to graduate school, we'll continue to work, work together. Okay, so the paper that we're presenting today is Religion and War Attitudes, and as Walter stated, the paper is currently under review in Politics and Religion. When asked how to address, address conflicting allegiances between Rome and God, Jesus answers, Render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Now for some progressive religious social activists, the things of God are the common spirituality, human dignity, and uniqueness of all individuals. In response to the 2003 invasion of Iraq, many progressive religious and lay leaders found themselves asking about their obligation to a universalistic ethos that placed themselves in kinship with all of humankind, versus a particularistic one that slowly obligated themselves to the nation. In doing so, many such activists were faced with the prospect of openly dissenting, openly protesting, or acquiescing to President Bush's decision to invade Iraq. Many of these activists chose dissent. So during the months and weeks leading up to the 2003 invasion, we saw mainline Catholic, Jewish, and Islamic lady and clergy as some of the strongest critics of the war. And in questioning the legitimacy of claims that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction, many of these anti-war religious leaders argued that the preemptive war failed to meet the just war criteria, failed to meet the just cause criteria of just war theory. They further argued that invading Iraq violated the proportionality clause of just war theory as it, it, as it would result in unjustifiable suffering, mental distress, and unnecessary civilian injuries and deaths. Some religious leaders even pondered the hidden motivation of the perceived threat that the former Iraqi President Saddam Hussein posed to Western corporate access to Middle Eastern oil. Despite their efforts, faith-based war protesters were largely out of step with the regular rank and file of the faith. For example, while the leadership of mainline, mainline Protestant and Catholic faith were largely opposed to the war in Iraq, Nearly two out of three of their laity actually supported invading Iraq in 2003. Now just to be clear, not all faith groups took the same position on the Iraq war. White evangelical Protestants were largely absent from these anti-war demonstrations as they were much more likely than others to support the war in Iraq. And while black Protestants were more opposed to the war in Iraq than other racial, ethnic, and faith groups, they were largely absent from these, these war demonstrations. That was the case for other racial ethnic minorities. So this raises questions about the role that race and religious faith may play in structuring how Americans think about American foreign policy. It also raises questions of how political dialogue in places of worship inform the disparate views that Americans hold on military policy. The present study attempts to address these questions by investigating the relative importance of lay and clergy political discourse on war attitudes among Americans of diverse race and faith backgrounds. Good afternoon and thank you for coming today. 
uh, we now turn to the literature to get a better idea of this relationship between religion and war attitudes. Our first point is that clergy and lay activists often infuse religious language and symbolism into their political discussions. A notable example of this is when, in a 2006 interview with the New York Times, Pastor John Hagee of Christians United for Israel proclaimed the Bush Doctrine to be consistent with, quote, God's foreign policy. A common thread throughout the literature is that congregation-based social capital likely forms the framework by which political attitudes may be formed or influenced. And this social capital is likely formed by way of the trust, reciprocity, and friendships formed within houses of worship. Frequently highlighted is the possibility that the limited time that clergy have to spend one-on-one -on -one with their laity may place constraints on their political influence. And this is likely due to the fact that fellow congregants have more of an opportunity to form and maintain close relationships with one another, whereas clergy have only so much time to spend with any one particular member of the church. In addressing how denominational affiliation may affect foreign policy attitudes, it is noted that evangelicals have consistently been the most supportive of the Iraq War and the Bush Doctrine, and that their support may be a function of their identification with President George W. Bush as a fellow evangelical Christian, given Bush's tendency to use religious language in his speeches. To that point, it is also important to note that Catholic, mainline Protestant, and black Protestant leaders felt that Bush misappropriated biblical stories and language, in effect turning religious faith into American civil religion. Examples of this include Bush's frequent use of words and phrases like crusade, mission, and charge to keep in relation to the war on terror. And in fact, in his 2003 State of the Union address, he referenced an old gospel hymn in saying that there is, quote, wonder-working power in the goodness and idealism and faith of the American people. Previous research has suggested that non-evangelicals, by contrast, are more likely to be led by clergy whose politics are informed by social justice concerns, uh, which is evidenced by the empirical finding that evangelicals are more likely to hear pro-war messages than are non-evangelicals. In previous research addressing racial differences in political thought and activism, it is evident that domestic issues tend to be more salient than foreign policy issues among racial minorities, which may help to explain their relative absence from anti-war demonstrations. In terms of the differential effects of political messages from clergy versus political messages amongst laity, the effects of clergy messages on lay opinion is still up for debate but previous work does show that discussions among laity are more important in inspiring political activism. These ambiguities in relation to the effects of clergy political messages on lay opinion, especially among racial minorities, leads us to our main research question. Is there a difference between the influence of lay versus clergy political discourse on how Americans of diverse religious faiths and racial ethnic backgrounds think about foreign policy. And I'll turn it back to Dr. Brown to present our findings in this area. Okay, so in addressing that research question, we are relying on the 2004 National Politics Study. This is a, a national study, a uh, national random sample of the United States. Um, the interview interview cycle took place during September 3rd, 2004, and February 25th, 2005. Um, so about two years, a couple years into the Iraq War. Um, people were interviewed through random digital telephone dialing. What's um, unique and um, a positive attribute about this study is the large oversample of racial and ethnic minorities um, in the study. This is one of the few studies that I know of that has such large oversamples of Hispanics, African Americans, Afro Caribbean Americans, and Asian Americans in the same sample. Um, so uh, this is an ideal study to look at this connection between religion and war among many different racial and ethnic groups. The response rate is around 31 percent, which is fairly typical for um, large national studies. Okay, so in this table right here, we're, we are looking at the connection between 
um, discussing politics in one's place of worship. Where's the clicker? Here we go. Looking at the impact of discussing politics in one place of worship. So, in the past 12 months, have you um, discussed um, political issues in your place of worship? Um, we're also looking at the impact of clergy political encouragement. So, in the past 12 months, have your, has your clergy encouraged you to take some political action in the form of protest, campaigning, contacting an elected official um, in the past 12 months? We're also looking at myself, right? uh, if people have heard sermons on the Iraq War or lectures on the Iraq War in the place of worship in the past 12 months. And then we're also looking at um, religious faith. So we're looking at mainline Protestants, Catholics, people of other faiths, and secular individuals in comparison to evangelical Protestants. Um, our dependent variables are, we have a, a variable that we've labeled pacifism, and pacifism variable is an index of these four dependent variables. Opposing the war in Iraq, the extent to which individuals opposed the war in Iraq, the extent to which individuals opposed detaining um, terror suspects in foreign countries, the extent to which people oppose the idea that it is necessary to go to war to keep weaker nations in their place, and the extent to, pe to which people support reduction in defense spending. So people said yes to all those questions, they got four on the pacifism scale. If they said that they don't oppose the war in Iraq, they're not opposed to the war in terror, they're not opposed to the necessity of war, and they are not supportive of reducing defense spending, then they got a zero on the pacifism scale. So zero means that you're heavily supportive of war, or it means you're heavily opposed to war on the pacifism scale. Um, and then these other measures are just the communist measures. Yes? Does other faith include Judaism and Islam? Yes, but there are so few people with Islamic faith in the, in the survey. I think it's less than 1% identified as Islamic in the other faith. So that category really is a, a meaningless category because you have so many different groups that are jumbled into that category, the other faith category. So you're not really learning much about Islam? No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Um, I mean, really, what you can pull from this is any. Again, this table is only a white, white Americans in this table right here. It's only white Americans. Um, so, yeah, the majority of white Americans identify as mainline Catholic, evangelical, and secular. Yeah. So if we look at this first uh, column right here, the pacifism column, what we see here, well, let me just back up. Overall, what this table is suggesting, and we'll go through each analysis one by one, but overall the table is suggesting that Individuals that are engaged in political discussion in their place of worship, that tends to make the difference in terms of how people think about war. People that are involved in political discussion in their place of worship tend to be more opposed to war than people that, than people that are not involved in these types of discussions. Clergy tend not to make that big of a difference in terms of how people think about war attitude. So, for example, if you look at the pacifism column, what we see is that people that discuss politics in church houses of worship are more likely to be pacifists or opposed to war in general than people that don't talk about politics in church, houses of worship. Um, we also see a significant effect for clergy political encouragement. So people that are encouraged by the clergy to engage in some form of political activism, they also tend to be more opposed to war in a global sense. We also see that Catholics, people of other faith, and secular individuals tend to be more opposed to war in general than our evangelical Protestants. If you look at the next column, looking at only people, that, um, looking at the next column, which asks about people's position on the Iraq war specifically, we see that, again, people that are, are engaged in political discussion in their houses of worship, they tend to be more opposed to the Iraq war. Um, clergy, however, is non-significant. There's no relationship between being encouraged by your clergy to engage in some form of political activism and people's position on the Iraq war. Doesn't make a difference. Um, if people heard a sermon or a lecture on the war in a place of worship, that tends to make a difference. People tend to be more opposed to war if they're exposed to that type of a sermon or a lecture. And again, we find that pretty much non-evangelicals, mainliners, Catholics, people of other faith, secular individuals, are more opposed to the war in Iraq than our evangelical Protestants. 
looking at this issue of opposing the war on terror, opposing um, detaining foreign terror suspects, we find that again, people are talking about politics in a place of worship, they tend to be more opposed to the war on terror. Clergy, however, clergy encouraging activism, non significant. It doesn't make a difference. Um, hearing a lecture or a sermon about Iraq in one place of worship, again, doesn't make a difference. No relationship there. Um, and the only group that's different from evangelical Protestants on opposing the war on terror are secular individuals. Secular individuals tend to be more opposed to the war on terror than our evangelical Protestants. We're looking at the opposing the necessity of war, again, it's the same story. We're talking about politics in your place of worship. People tend to oppose this idea of going to war to keep weaker nations in their place. We don't see any effect for clergy encouraging activism. Um, being exposed to sermons or lectures on Iraq. Um, and again, we see that Catholics, people of other faiths, and secular individuals tend to be uh, more opposed to this idea um, than evangelical Protestants. In the last column, we're looking at reduction in defense spending. Again, people that are engaged in political discussion in their place of worship, they tend to support reduction in defense spending. Clergy, however, they don't make a difference in how people think about this issue. If people are hearing a sermon or a lecture on Iraq in a place of worship, again, it doesn't make a difference. There's no statistical difference in how people think about defense spending. And finally, we see that people of other faiths and secular individuals tend to be more supportive of reduction in defense spending than evangelical Protestants. Now again, this is only of white Americans here in this uh, these analysis right here. This next um, figure right here, um, is a, a visual representation of uh, an interaction effect that we ran. And what we wanted to know is, that, is um, to what extent does discussing politics in the place of worship have a different effect on how people think about war among the different faith groups um, in the study. Um, and what we largely found is that, if you look at, I mean, it's fairly clear, if you look at people of other faiths and mainland Protestants, when they talk about politics in their place of worship, they tend to be more opposed to war in a global sense. Um, when you look at evangelical Protestants and Catholics, it really doesn't make a difference. It doesn't um, inform how they think about um, war. Now this right here, probability um, figure, is only of the, the global pacifism question. But we ran the interaction analysis for all four of the dependent variables, and it works fairly similar for all four of those um, dependent variables. So opposing the war in Iraq, opposing the war on terror, opposing the necessity of defense spending to keep weaker nations in their place, um, and, and supporting reduction in defense spending. We largely see this, this pattern right here, and we do also see a significant interaction effect um, in that the mainline effect tends to be significantly different from the evangelical and Catholic effect in our analysis. Now, when we ran these same analysis for, for the racial and ethnic minorities, there was largely non-findings across the board. So for African Americans, for Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, religion, religious faith, and discourse if people are talking about politics, or people are being encouraged by the clergy to engage in political activism, or people are exposed to lectures or sermons about the Iraq war, it did not make a statistical difference. I mean, for these groups, religion is largely unrelated to how they felt about war. So, just to summarize, recap what, what I've just gone over, what we find is that among whites, non-evangelicals largely maintain more oppositional war attitudes than do evangelical Protestants. Um, it's also the case that among whites, lay involvement in political discussion is associated with greater war opposition. However, being encouraged to take political action by clergy or hearing sermons or lecture, lectures on the right war or not. Um, what makes a difference is, is if people are actively involved in political discussions themselves with others, that makes a difference in terms of how people think about the war in Iraq. If people are simply just being encouraged or exposed to sermons or lectures, it doesn't seem to make a difference in terms of how whites think about the war in Iraq. Um, when we dug a little bit deeper into this question of looking at how does 
lay political discourse and how's, how's the worship inform how people, how whites think about, uh, about war. What we found is that um, this discourse, being involved in political discussions um, in houses of worship, more strongly informs the opposition of war attitudes as mainline Protestants than it does for evangelical Protestants and white Catholics. And again, we find that religion is largely unrelated to non-white war attitudes. Turn over to So this study built on previous work which suggests that religious role plays, plays a, or religious faith plays a role in informing foreign policy attitudes. We suggest that the negligible impact of clergy on the foreign policy attitudes of white congregations in particular may reflect an ideological divide between white clergy and their laity. That is, that white clergy may tend to be more liberal than their laity or vice versa. Our findings are consistent with previous work that suggests that social capital networks may explain why lay discussion is more conducive to forming strong foreign policy positions. We speculate that our finding that congregation-based political discourse is unrelated to Catholic war attitudes may reflect the difficulty in formulating discussion given the hierarchical nature of the Catholic Church. However, this is just speculation and more research is needed on the effects of church polity on lay social networks and their ability to shape foreign policy attitudes. Furthermore, we suggest that our finding that lay political discussion has little effect on the war attitudes of, of racial minorities may suggest that foreign policy concerns are largely a class-based luxury, meaning that in churches that primarily serve racial minority groups, Domestic concerns such as unemployment and neighborhood safety may take precedence over foreign policy and hence there are fewer opportunities to discuss and formulate opinions on war matters. And in sum, the results of the present study indicate that the ability of houses of worship to shape political attitudes is likely informed by opportunities for political discourse, the interplay of theology and ideology, issue salience, and church structure and polity. Thank you. Yeah, there's yeah. lots of time for discussion. I had two questions. Go on. One, uh, the, the brief reference to class. Uh, yeah. did you, 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 met, you had a measure for oh, class. Oh, sorry. That, right? sorry. I, 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 yeah, these analysis, we also took into account Worship attendance, age, gender, region, education, and income. So you controlled for the last Yeah, we did. Yeah. Okay, so it relates to the second question that your findings are somewhat reminiscent of my recollection of the Vietnam Day findings mm -hmm. in terms of religion and war attitudes. Right. Not as maybe uh, not specific as this. Right. But I recall that Dr. King and Malcolm X mm -hmm. both had very strong sermon type right. messages about the war right. and about war in general right. and given that fact I wonder why such notable figures had seemingly have had such negligible impact on minority opinion about wars. Well I mean I think one um, is, is the point that, that Aaron brought up a little bit earlier in terms of um, the dominant um, policy concerns of these different groups. Um, and I mean, the issue today I think, is a little bit different from the issue during um, Vietnam. Because during Vietnam, at least, I think you could make an easier connection that um, there was a connection between um, um, being working class and poor and potentially being drafted and going to Vietnam. And if you're looking at um, the mortality statistics, you know, there's, I mean, you know, there's over representation of people that were poor from black backgrounds that ended up you know, on the front line of that war, which is very different today. Um, but the Iraq War. And I think today you have this, this, this disconnect between foreign policy and actually domestic policy. If you look, I mean, if you look at the surveys from 2002, 2003, 2004, and I mean, even right now, you consistently see that for African Americans and Hispanic Americans, the top concerns are um, neighborhood safety, um, public education, jobs, things of that nature. And foreign policy tends to be, you know, way down on the list. 
and for white Americans, particularly during uh, the before election, foreign policy concerns were near the top of the list. So I think that's part of it. I think the other part of it, particularly for, for African American churches, is an issue of just infrastructure within the churches, in terms of the resources that the churches have to actually to do lobbying and to do research and then inform their um, local pastors and, and uh, congregants of the positions they're taking and why. Um, so in contrast to mainline Protestant churches and the Catholic church, where you have actually lobbying arms and state houses and in Washington, D.C., African American churches largely, they don't have that for the most part. Um, and so it's, I think it's more difficult for um, African American clergy uh, to stay connected to what, to what the, the denomination officials, the position they're taking on issues, and then to disseminate and draw connections between what people are going on, what people are going through in their local neighborhoods and these larger foreign policy concerns. Um, but the mainline Protestants and Catholic groups, they have an infrastructure in place which makes it a lot, a lot easier for them to do. So I think you have both of that going on. One is um, domestic policy, I mean, what people are concerned about just based upon their day-to-day -day lives. And the second part is infrastructure of these religious institutions and the ability to uh, disseminate their policy positions to local congregations. So I think that's, that's what I think is, is going on uh, with black churches. Uh, and then if you're looking at, for example, Hispanic, Asian, Afro-Caribbean, you have this, the, the immigrant interplay that's going on as well. So among like, these groups, um, um, where, for example, in our, in our sample, um, Hispanic and Asian Americans, nearly two-thirds of those groups were first-generation immigrants. And among Afro-Caribbeans, nearly half were first-generation immigrants. So um, among these groups, you have issues of assimilation and acculturation that are taking um, um, center stage and what these groups are concerned about. And if groups are just immigrating to the country, then they're probably not going to take too, you know, be too vocal in protesting foreign policy concerns of you know, the country that they're immigrating to. In your conclusion, to talk about church structure, can you spell that out a little more, please? Well, I mean, what we mean by that is that, and again, we can only speculate on this because we don't have any data, but what we're talking about is that within the Protestant churches, there's much more of an ability for lay people to get involved within local congregations and set policy within these congregations. Whereas with Catholic churches, we're speculating that because of the hierarchical nature of the church and the role that the priest plays in relation to laity, that lay people may have less of an opportunity um, to actually influence the local culture of these local parishes. Now, we don't know. We're just we're speculating um, based upon past research. Um, but that's our assumption of what, what may be going on. That, I mean, that's why we believe that among mainline, at least among mainline Protestants, when they're involved in political discussions, it seems to have some impact on how they think about these foreign policy discussions. Um, and perhaps because of um, the role that ladies play in Catholic churches versus mainline Protestant churches, that they just have less of an opportunity to, uh, to enact influence within their local congregation. Um, I'm curious to know how, it, how the discrepancy between clergy and the membership was measured in that, was it how the lay populations perceived the clergy's messages to be received? Or was there two studies simultaneously going? Well, in, in this study, we, we don't measure um, lay opinion, the actual opinion of lay in contrast to the opinion of clergy. Um, past studies have done that, and we mentioned some of these studies um, in the talk. And actually, this wasn't different from the Vietnam War era either, in terms of the role that clergy took on uh, positions of war versus the position that lay took in positions of war. Um, and among the liberal faiths, um, among whites, you see big gaps between what the position that clergy are taking. I mean, in the demonstrations leading up um, to the, to the um, invasion of Iraq, I mean, many of these marches were interface marches with um, clergy leadership. And by clergy leadership, I'm talking about denominational officials, people in the national offices that are involved, or regional offices that are involved um, in organizing these marches. Um, but their position and the resolutions that they took and the press, press releases that they, they were writing Two-thirds of the people that attended these congregations said they were fine with it, the Iraq War. And I think what's, in a, I think what, what's, what's going on, the, the challenge that clergy have 
in trying to influence opinion on controversial issues is that, and, and Aaron mentioned this, is that they're also going up against um, the civil religious discourse that elected officials um, are engaged in. So Bush talks about, during um, the months leading up to, to the Iraq War, um, he talked about this being a crusade. He mentioned you know, an act of evil in which there are clear contrasts between um, America and these foreign powers. Um, and, and in an attempt to um, dichotomize um, people's position on this war. Um, and the use of, usage of you know, hymns and biblical verses was not accidental. I mean, I think it was, it was very strategic um, because he was tapping into um, the religious symbolism of, of the nation. And so you have clergy that, that are attempting to use religious imagery and symbols to try to get people to think about war in a certain way. And then you have elected officials that are doing the same thing. The difference is that elected officials are on TV, they're on the radio, they're on newspapers. So six days out of the week, you're hearing um, religious symbols used to justify and to rationalize you know, why the U.S. should go to war. And then perhaps one day, if you go, you may hear a dissenting opinion. And so I think that's it's, uh, it's tough competition, it's stiff competition um, for clergy when they're trying to combat the predominant image that they're hearing on the media, uh, through newsprint, on the radio, or, or television. Um, and that's why I think that clergy didn't have any influence at all, you know, for the most part, um, on public people thought. Do we have one back here? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you consider political parties of the nation? We did. We did take that into account. Yeah. So that was one of the variables that we controlled for okay. party affiliation. I forgot to put that up there. Yeah. Uh, I'll follow up on that. Yeah. What, um, not obviously, this is the point. Was there a difference in the support of the war between Republican, oh, Catholic, yeah. Republican Catholics and, and Oh, we uh, didn't. We didn't look into that. We, we didn't well, put it that way. But that I'm sure there. I'm sure that, that that something be. worth looking at because maybe the best predictor of support for the war is simply who they supported in the previous election. Oh no, it is. Uh, no, so that is a good, you know, good. evangelical Protestants are heavily weighted in the South. Right. Okay, and they're also, in yeah, they're terms voting. of previous elections, somewhere around 80, 90 percent voting for the Republican candidate. Right. And so that may account for most of the variance. Well, no, but we do take that into account, though. We do take party affiliation into account when we're running these analysis right there. So we take party affiliation into account along with those other control variables as well. We didn't do, we did not look at within each faith group, you know, how does, do our Democratic versus Republican Catholics, do they take a different position on the war? Do Democratic versus Republican mainland Protestants take a different position on the war? We didn't split the analysis that way, but we do take party affiliation into account. Well, okay. I know, I mean, you're, 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 you're saying that perhaps what we see here in terms of the faith differences and how they support the war is linked to the party affiliation. Yeah, right. I, I don't want to get into in this, but, but you'll understand the concept that, that if you did a multiple regression, it could be that once party enters, faith makes very little difference. Right, but we do include party in this now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, one question, just technical. How did you code the sort of church-specific variables for people who were not affiliated with the religion? The secular group? Yeah. So if they say that they were no religion, or they say that they, they didn't go to church at all. Oh, no, 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 no. They have to say that they were no religion. Okay. They have to say that they were no religion, or they have to say that they were secular. Yeah. Right. And then how were they coded on, like, heard a sermon, clergy encouraged activism, discussed politics? So then if you. It would be kind of. I mean, well, still, if they didn't hear anything, then they would get zero. They were asked those questions, though, still. Right, yeah. Yeah. And so then, it, so even if you're a secular, you still have an opportunity to answer these questions right here. They still ask those. Right. So the discuss politics was that question asked specifically about church? Yes, and house yes. of worship. Is it? Did you discuss politics in house of worship? Right. Yeah. So I just wonder if you. It seems like the obvious issue would just be sort of your basic selection, or sort of the reverse causality. So I mean, you could say, the big story here is that people who are more conservative don't talk about politics at church, right. rather than sort of saying it's actually these discussions that 
you know, change your beliefs. People that are more conservative tend not to. Yeah, if you just sort of, because it's cross-sectional, right? If you right. say it's actually selection, so the people who are against the war seek out these discussions in their house of worship. But we don't know what they're talking about, though. I mean, the, the politics question is just a general question about are you talking about politics? politics. So they're, they're not saying, are you talking about opposing the war in Iraq or opposing the different issues. They're just asking, in general, are you talking about politics in your place of worship? Do you talk about politics? Right in your place of worship right. was sort of the question. Right, right. Yeah. That was sort of my other question was, I mean, it's, if you look, it's discussed politics as the most effect, but you're sort of asking about beliefs. So do you think if you had a question that was more about action, yeah. then perhaps that activism question would be significant then? If you ask me, have they actually taken action? Yeah, have oh. you actually taken action? So you yeah. see what I'm saying? Like, right. you could see that just the way the variables are coded or right. they're measured right. sort of stacks it towards the ideas and beliefs being more likely to have, because but the outcome is ideas and beliefs. But yeah, you can, yeah, you're right, right. But in both I mean, questions, they're asking about, on the discussed policy, they're just asking, are you talking about different political issues and things like that in your place of worship? And then in the, the clergy one is actually asking, encouraging people to take action. Yeah, if the cl clergy encourage you to take the action. So what I'm saying is if you had an outcome yeah. that was, have you actually participated? In an anti-war demonstration? Then perhaps you would find that clergy variable would have more of an impact. Perhaps. Well, you know what, actually, uh, in another study that I did, and it wasn't related to, another study that I did, we, we, I did like a political activism. Mm -hmm. It wasn't political activism that related to a specific issue, just have you campaigned, have you protested, have you contacted an elected official, and the results look strikingly similar. So what you find in that study is pretty much among whites, it's the same thing. The clergy that are encouraging activism, they don't make a difference. It's only when people are talking about it. And what I think is going on, and again, it's the point that Aaron was making, is this idea of social capital and the, and the ability um, to engage um, in discussions with people that you like in your place of worship. Yeah. Versus having somebody that you have relatively little contact with telling you to you should do this, you should do that, you should do something else. And if you disagree with them, then maybe it's completely discounted. But if you're involved in discussions where you, there may be disagreement in the, the discussion that you're having, but if you like the people, then you're at least uh, you're arguing. There's a willingness to consider these different points of view and perhaps alter your point of view based upon the discussion that you're having. But the key thing, this, this idea of social capital, is the trust and the reciprocity and this general love that's involved between individuals that choose a particular house of worship. Um, and with clergy, there's just less of an opportunity for that to happen. Um, so I think that's what's going on right there. Um, but How many secularists were there in this? Uh, I think among the whites, I think there's around 150. So yeah. to follow this point, could you be biasing the result by having them in this, in this run because they, right from the get-go, aren't going to hear church and they're not going to be participating in church discussions, so should you run it without them? Well, I mean, they, they, I mean they're less likely to hear these. They still have asked the question, though. They're less I know. Likely, yeah. But they're going to say no, right? No, no, not all of them said no. No? No. Right. Considering that women form the uh, mainstay of the church, yeah. I see you controlling for gender. Yeah. Are we to assume that uh, most of the people in this, in the churches that you've studied, uh, men or women, or what's your sense of it? How should we well, I mean, get through this? No, I mean, past studies, I, past studies suggest that women are more likely to attend. And in that case? It's more than men. And, and so their, their appreciation of this, of the discourse would be in what direction? They would be more conservative or less conservative? Or? Um, well, okay, in terms of uh, their position on the war, they were more opposed to war than men. Um, I'm not sure if, if uh, hearing about politics, if, I'm not sure if discussing politics in places of worship had a different impact on how women thought about the war than among men. Again, I think that would be very interesting to see because be. yeah. we have much more, you know, the women are in the church, uh, not the clergy, but right. the bulk of them. No, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. And we would tend to be opposed to war anyways. Oh, yeah, you're right. That's good. I kind of uh, 
reported that Dr. Morrow had said about the selection about people who dis actually discuss politics at church. I mean, now, I know that you said that uh, they weren't discussing the war. That question didn't ask them where you're specifically discussing the war. There was just a general you discuss politics. But, um, could it be possible that people who discuss politics at church would be more likely to be like with a hot discourse versus a cold discourse, and they would generally be anti-war? I don't think that's what's going on. I mean, I think that that's the part. Yeah, is it, it, what, what, what is going on? That. Uh, I mean, yeah, the people that are discussing politics tend to be, you know, more opposed to war than people that are not talking about politics. Um, but in terms of the selection bias, though, I, it'd be difficult because we, if they ask people, are you talking about, are, when you're talking about, if they ask people, are you, do your discussions about politics tend to be anti-war? Then you can say, okay, then the anti-war people are probably going to, you know, these congregations, and of course they're going to have that and on um, the war. Um, but because the term is just in general, we don't know exactly what position, what they were talking about, what position they were taking on the war. Um, um, or we don't know that people are going to these political discussions um, because they know that everybody there um, takes an anti-war position um, because that information is not provided. So we're assuming that because you know, political discussions tend to lend itself to people being anti-war, that these, that these discussions uh, once people are there, um, they tend to be more critical. And it, tend to, it does tend to inform how they think about the war. Um, but I would be kind of wary of the, the selection bias because we just don't know going in what's being discussed. It was the same question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Following up on what Dave said before, uh, Rather than uh, entitling religion and war attitudes, as you know, uh, sociology, social psychology, social sciences have been criticized for studying mainly what people say, uh, uh, for studying attitudes, opinions, and beliefs, uh, not as much uh, social relationships, uh, behavior, etc. Uh, that kind of criticism has become hackneyed sometimes, but uh, the title of your study uh, lends itself to, to that kind of criticism. Uh, the word attitudes lends itself to that kind of criticism. Uh, maybe you should emphasize attitudes, behavior, etc. Um, well, I mean, yes. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, well, again, we in this study, we were, we were not able to study um, behaviors. Um, I suspect, though, that I think that we would see a different pattern um, if you look at actual behaviors because it's, it's difficult to go out and engage in either participate in demonstrations or if you're going to study groups where you're talking about the war um, or you're contacting elected officials with the intent of trying to um, influence how they vote um, on just the war. I mean, that's, that's difficult to do. Um, so I would suspect that um, the pattern would be different. but. Um, I mean, there's a number of reasons why, I mean, people may take position on the war, but for a number of reasons are not able to actually take action on it. Um, may not have the resources to take action on it. No one may have contacted you and asked you if you want to participate um, in a given demonstration. If someone had asked you, you may have said yes. Um, but, so, even, even though that um, perhaps the behaviors may be different from the attitudes, I, I don't think that it means that the attitudes are disingenuous. Um, because to get involved in you know, an anti-war demonstration or a study group, uh, there has to be some type of re resource. And generally what happens is that someone asks you. I mean, generally, that's, I mean, the way that people tend to get involved in the, the resource, the difficult form of activism, which means you have to, not just voting once a week, but you know, ongoing activism, is that there's someone that's, that you like and trust is asking you to participate and encouraging you to stay active. Um, so. Um, I think that I mean the results may not have been as strong um, if we looked at people that behavior towards these specific types of activities, um, but I don't think that they mean that they're disingenuous. In terms of just as a matter of discussion, yeah. your study more generally is about the effects of religion on attitudes towards foreign policy. So the implied behavior is, of course, voting, 
as a matter of discussion. Oh yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if we the attitudes are going to be one of the best predictors of what way you're going to vote on foreign policy issues related issues, right? Right. I mean, there's, there's a strong connection between that, right. between people's position on the war and how they felt about Bush in the study. Yeah. Now, the interesting, Ann and I were talking about this, is how it would look looking at people's attitudes towards Obama um, in 2008. We have 2008 data, but it's not exactly clean yet, so we don't want to start running any numbers on it. But I think there would be some type of attention, a stronger, so in the same way that evangelical Protestants strongly identify with President Bush, because they saw him as a fellow evangelical one of their own, um, mainline Protestants um, may see the same, at least the leadership of mainline Protestants may see Obama in the same light. And it would be interesting to see um, the analysis in 2008, 2012, particularly 2012, when Obama is in office and you're still, you're still in Iraq, you're still in Afghanistan, you have Obama in Libya, to see um, these connections because um, just in the same way that evangelical Protestants largely, I would say, gave Bush the benefit of the doubt and how he used religious imagery in justifying the wars in Iraq, in this example, you can make the same case for Obama um, when he's talking about Afghanistan and Libya. Um, and it would be interesting to see, you know, how do these particularly the faith groups, how do, how, how do religious faith differences change when the administration changes? When you go from Republican administration to a Democratic administration, but the policy doesn't seem to be you know, that much different. Um, so you mentioned how President Bush used religious language in the build-up to the Iraq War. So it seems like on some level you're saying that it's possible that an elected political official has more influence on a parishioner than their pastor, clergy. Well, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think, um, I think, um, well, I mean, actually, there are surveys on this where they ask people, you know, who influences, how you think about foreign policy. And generally, people are saying things like the news, uh, television news, or uh, print news, and religion tends to be a little bit lower on that list. Um, and so the argument that we're making is that you have both um, elected officials and you have clergy and religious leaders that are using religious imagery um, to moralize their position on different public policy issues. In this, position, in this example, we're talking about foreign policy issues. Um, and the clergy have much more of a limited opportunity to insert, to enact this influence because this is the limited time that they have um, when they're in front of their congregation in whole. Whereas, you know, seven days of the week, can listen to talk radio or you know, network news, um, and you'll hear at least sound bites of elected officials or people that are supportive of the administration using these you know, religious undertones to um, support the war, um, and the, and the, particularly in the 2002 and 2003 build up to the war in Iraq. So, um, and I mean, these findings right here um, are not too different from the study that I saw um, in the Vietnam War era. You saw big gaps between, particularly among the liberal faiths. So um, Catholics and mainline Protestants, where they, the, the, the clergy study these issues versus the laity. Um, and so in some respects, clergy may be a little bit um, guarded about what they actually say in front of their congregants if they think that it may turn them off to the extent that they stop coming and stop putting money in the offering plate. Um, during the, um, I, mean, I, can't, I, think, I can't remember the author's name, but there were couple of books during um, the 19, early 1970s that talked about this mainline um, crisis in the church between the conflict between the leadership and the laity on issues of civil rights and, and the war. Um, and the clergy, you know, <coughs> had to be guarded because congregants are the people that are the volunteers, they're the main source of, finan of um, financing for the church, for, for the houses of worship, and it's clearly voluntary. People don't have to go. So I think in that respect, clergy um, may have to be guarded and what they're actually talking about. They may, they may not actually um, uh, talk about their true positions and encourage